All right, welcome to the Warriors Cast. Uh, Jerem Jordan alongside Jared Banks or Banksy. Uh, you can share the Warriors Cast on YouTube, Facebook, SoundCloud, IGTV, Apple Podcasts. Leave us a rating and review as well. We are inside of the uh, the facility here uh, in Harriman, Zions Bank Stadium, just outside where the Warriors play their matches. Home first home match coming up in a couple of weeks, and this is a facility where sometimes the team trains. Inside, they'll look at film. This is a nice facility for the Warriors to be in. This is one of the top training facilities in the world. When this opened, teams from several different sports from all over the world came to check out how they built it, how it was put together, the span that's in there. There's no vertical pillars in between the walls anywhere. It's a big giant open space and both of the fields in here are actually FIFA regulation size soccer fields. That's massive and that's awesome. Use the hashtag WarriorsCast to send in questions and comments anytime throughout the season. Here's what's on the show today. We'll recap the loss at Colorado, what happened there. Major injury for the Warriors. We'll talk about it. Around the league week four, uh, match preview with Seattle, the back-to-back champs uh utah trying to go up there and win uh our player spotlight the hooker uh to vere vunga koto uh, rugby 101 what a mall is uh if nola had completed them all they would have upset san diego we'll talk about that and we'll chat with the centers dominic uh toluono and calvin whiting so let's recap the loss 22 to 14 at colorado score probably looks a, a little closer than it was the last five minutes, the Warriors make it really interesting, and we're down eight with the ball in hand, but turn it over that leads directly to a try that kind of seals it. The scoop and score at the end was a bit of a dagger and a little bit of controversy there as well. If you go back and roll tape, touch judge's flag was up. Okay? Oh, come on. Touch judge's flag was up. Uh, could have been a crucial moment in the game, but it, look, at the end of the day, you can't leave it in the hands of the refs, right? There was a lot of points that were left on the board, a lot of opportunities that went wanting for Warriors fans. And really it was just about uh, the inability to finish in the final third and the, the creativity on offense I really felt was, was missing there. Yes, the strategy clearly early was let's kick and uh, you know kick as much and get territory and uh, let's pin Colorado back. And it was working at first, but the knee injury to Hagen Schulte is a huge story, not only in this match, but for the rest of the season. Uh, Robbie Povey steps in. He, in, he kicked pretty well, but uh, Hagen Schulte was the guy leading the league in points, and now he's got a knee injury that honestly probably caught that injury weighs into the reason Utah lost, and then looking ahead, uh, it's going to be a little different. When you lose that kind of leadership on the field, especially in a close game on the road like that, it's going to make a difference, and you know we have a next man up mentality here. Obviously, Robbie stepping in and taking those kicking duties and did a really good job, managed to keep the pressure on, but when you lose that kind of leadership, it's really tough. It's such a crucial position to recover from that. Last five minutes, uh, Hulaholu, Moungaloa, and Sai Uhila with a couple of tries to make it interesting, right? Ends up being 22-14, just a point off that bonus point. Every point matters. Didn't quite get it. Uh, so uh, Utah stays with seven points and second in the Western Conference. Our first look at Rennie Ranger, the former All Black. Uh, man to number 13, had two tries, had a couple of big hits. He was uh, tough to defend. He's one of my favorite players of all time as, as an Auckland Blues fan What a great well. name, by the way. You know, I, I love mean, that. The guy runs hard. He's got crazy hair. He looks like an absolute wild man. <laughs> but really hadn't lived up to the hype like some of the other international players had throughout the season, but showed up with two big tries in this game, uh, one in each half. Yuri Van Vuren leads the way with a team high 19 tackles. He continues to just fly around. Absolutely showing out and uh, – and being a leader and doing the things that you would want somebody of his caliber to do and setting the example in the forward pack really responded and answered, uh, you know, even with the substitutions with uh, with Saya coming in uh, and and uh, and Holo as well. Those guys did what you would want your forwards to do on a substitution situation. They brought energy. They made an impact on the game. You know, it was just too little too late by that point, I think. There were a few opportunities where I thought, OK, if Hagen Schulte's in this match, he's kicking for points and that's get that's helping right and Robbie did a nice job we just didn't see the dynamic play that we saw the week before with the backs and and I still don't feel like we've seen what the backs can do in space quite yet right forwards I, I've been pretty impressed with uh, what they've been able to do 100 percent in the line out um, in, in this game so looking forward to that and now the question becomes uh, with Haken Schulte uh, you know out for some time, uh, what happens with the kicking game? Is Robbie Povey the guy? Does he step in at 10? Certainly guys that can fill in at fullback, but uh, is that the direction the Warriors go, you think? I don't know where Coach Latham's going to go with it. Obviously, the, you know, the, the staff with, with Sean and Zim, they've, they've got a lot of things to figure out in the lab this week. We've seen a ton of movement all throughout the back line. You know, really the only thing that's been consistent is, is Dwayne and Hagen at 9 and 10. 
every other position has had a different starter almost the entire season. We haven't seen a set back line really show itself the way we have with the forward pack. We know now with the forwards pretty much who we're going to see week to week. The, fr the front row solidified itself. Uh, the second row combination has worked out really well, especially in the, in the lineouts. We see the dominance in the air. Matt Jensen continuing it from last year. And, uh, and, um, and John Cullen being able to really step up and be that second set of hands mm -hmm. and, and be a difference maker in the air. The loose forwards have been absolutely incredible and flying all over the field this year, but we haven't seen that same consistency in the back line yet. And with Hagen now out with that knee, more question marks arise. Now, good news with some of our other players getting healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, Lethos got some options, but it'll be interesting to see what they come up with to see who fills in where. Looking forward at some point seeing Tanata Lauti, a guy who led the league in uh, tries a couple years ago. I talked to him today, actually, uh, as, as they were in the weight room, and he was pushing some weights, and I asked him, I says, are you feeling good? And he gave me a big smile and a wink, you know. And, and it's, That's and the it's, default for him, right? right? You know, I said, hey. <laughs> I was like, are you good, but are you good, good? And he's like, I'm pretty good. So that's about as much information as you're going to get from him, you know, in his cheeky own little way. But <laughs> the fact that, you know, the, the attitude is there, the energy is there, I, I would hope we could see a return uh, from Tanata there with the options like Calvin, I think, really kind of owning now that 13 spot, who's going to play inside of him. And then if we can have Gannon Moore on one side and if Fetz can get back healthy on the other side, you know, and Oof. then, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, Josh Whippy getting healthy now in the back or Robbie really kind of showing out and showing the class that he is in that number 15 jersey last week. You know, he could stake his uh, his flag in that position. Yeah. You know, so there's there's a lot of options. Mm -hmm. It just it depends on what combination of healthy guys can get in on any given game day. Yeah. The points have got to go up. That much is clear. And the points end up being scored at the end of the day, mostly by the backs. Right. They put you in position. The Fords are doing a tremendous job. Looking forward to the backs kind of showing who they really are. Okay, around the league, San Diego uh, beat NOLA. You predicted the first half of the season, the first eight, that San Diego would not lose. NOLA is down four. They have a five-meter line out. They start the mall. The mall goes to ground. They don't get it out. Penalty goes to San Diego, and San Diego survives. Momentum stopped. You thought that was going to be the moment. They got the first initial shove. San Diego responded well, held it up. You get two movements, so when your initial forward momentum stops, the referee will give you a second shove, and then you have to get the ball out and use it. But the ball goes to ground and is not able to come out of the mess after that turnover ball in San Diego. Holds on to they a hold nail on, biter. On the road. That was and a big win. Again, Ma'anonu showing the class that he's got, making MLR Team of the Week again yep. at that number 12 position. Just an absolute absolute master class in what you would expect from uh, from a center of his caliber. And he got yeah, number 12 from uh, all year. He got banged up a little bit on a play, actually came out uh, for a moment. So hopefully he's all right. Uh, they'll be in town uh, in about a month. Uh, Seattle gets its first win of the season. They beat New England 44-29. I'm a Seahawks fan, so I wish that was over the Patriots. But uh, largest margin of victory of any team this week, by the way. Ben Seema, 6 for 6. That's uh, the opponent. We'll preview that matchup coming up. But Seattle had started 0-3. They finally get a win. You know, it's, it's a scary thing to be a Warriors fan going into Seattle and seeing them finally click. Maybe you know? better than if they were 0-4 and just crazed at that point. I don't know. I would rather <laughs> see them desperate at 0-4 than see them come off of a win like that and get to go home at, in front of their fans at their house with some confidence because, I mean, they showed it last week. They can score in buckets full, and they've got some real athletes on that team. The Canadian B team, a.k.a. the Toronto Arrows, as you call them, beat <laughs> Rugby ATL 28-18 on the road. Uh, the Eastern Conference is just really impressive at this point. West wide open. We'll, we'll walk through the standings in a second, but yeah, Toronto beats Rugby ATL. That game close at the half, but you know, Toronto being the class of the East and they're not doing anything special. And you know, I've called it out before. They're just a good technical rugby team. They're well coached. They're well disciplined. They do all of their things from one to 23 on the game day roster. Everybody knows their job and they just go out and execute. It's not ooh ah wow rugby. It's just good quality from every single guy in that arrow shirt. Uh, 18 points allowed defensively. That got it done. And Rooney, Rugby United New York, beats Houston in Texas 31 23. That was a fun game to watch uh, if you're a Rooney fan. Um, you know, Rooney really kind of coming on. They were a little underwhelming last year with some big international additions this year. Uh, 
and best row playing at the number eight spot you know where he played in the back line with uh with ma while they were in europe so a switch mm. to the forward pack for big matthew best row, but it's worked out so far yeah. with him wearing the number eight jersey that was the kyle sumption bowl the former BYU cougar down here played for houston for a couple years now he's with rooney coaching at uh army i believe so two and two in the east versus west matchups by the way is there western pride do we have western conference pride here is that a thing or no? I, 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 I have Warriors pride. That's about it. <laughs> I root for the Warriors and, and, no who, one else. and whoever's playing Toronto. That's who I root for. <laughs> Don't at me. All right. Don't, Don't at me. At him. Life of, ba- life of banks. All right. <laughs> Don't at me. <laughs> Don't at me. Here's my handle. <laughs> Western Conference, San Diego with 19 points. They're like a match away from clinching the playoff spot. <laughs> They're plus 12. Like it's silly. Uh, the Utah Warriors still in second place. How about that? With seven, despite the struggles, still at seven. Seattle with six. The difference six. it would have made getting those two points out of that match yes. would have moved us from the eight spot, I think, into the six spot. You're saying, oh, you're saying overall. Overall. Yeah. And, Which, and giving a little breathing room there in the West for us to be able to come into a big pressure situation with sure. Seattle now sure. and, and have a little confidence. And the overall standings are interesting because they don't really matter. It's the top three in each league. And this year, if you're the East, you're going, what? It's like the NBA the last few years with the Western Conference. Right. Like, all the Eastern teams suck. But in the Western Conference, it's San Diego and a bunch of teams that have single-digit points right now. Utah in second. Seattle in third. So it's a battle of two and three this week. Uh, then you have Houston and uh, Colorado with five. And then uh, Austin, uh, the, what, the Austin whatevers uh, with three <laughs> points. Uh, the they Gil- have a name. The Gilgronies. Okay. The it's, whatevers. I know they have a name. I'm just kidding. It's not a sin to say their name. <laughs> the last two weeks we've been at bars. I'm perfectly comfortable. We're all good. Eastern Conference, Toronto with 18 points. Just one shy of San Diego, by the way. Rooney with 14. Old Glory DC with 13. Nola with 11. Rugby ATL with 10. All of those teams, by the way, would be in higher than uh, the second place team in the West, which is the worst. And then uh, New England Free Jacks with eight. Free Jacks jumped out strong. They kind of struggled the last couple weeks, starting with the loss to Utah, which is the one win. But how would you assess the uh, standing so far? I would expect to see that out of New England with a new franchise. I think really rugby ATL is the big surprise in there hmm. and how well they've been able to do as an expansion team. A lot of experience yep. on that team, though. A lot of really good veteran leadership, uh, but really showing the – it doesn't look like it when I say this, but the parity across the league, the level of competition – from the new teams and the expansion teams, as well as the existing franchises, is all being raised in the MLR. And, yeah. it, and I really think that's what's showing out here in a team like Seattle struggling and a team like Toronto continuing to excel and grow. A team like Seattle, who's struggled, but now seems to be back in the winning track. And San Diego, picking up where they left off from last year. Okay, we're a fourth of the way through the season, four into 16 regular season games, right? How do you think this shakes out in the end? San Diego, clearly the best team in the West. I think it's it feels kind of open. I wouldn't be shocked if, like, Seattle was number two when the dust settled, right? And maybe that's where the Warriors kind of fit in is that can they be that second or third spot? Because San Diego clearly feels like a notch above right now. They really have set the standard for the entire league to be chasing with the quality of play. Uh, even though Toronto are just a point back in the standings, it's really San Diego and everybody else right now. If the Warriors can start putting together some quality wins, and we knew this was going to be tough, six road games to open the season. We knew this was going to be a big hurdle coming in, yeah. that it was going to be a huge challenge, not just for a new coach coming in, but for this squad that's still looking for an identity to have to do that all on the road. But now here and we are. And that's what Toronto's doing, by in the a, way. In a position right yeah. now, though, still, yeah. even with all the adversity that we've had, to come out of this as we head into now our home opener, to be able to make a statement here and stake a claim significantly to that number two spot in the West. Not fighting for three or four on the outside looking in, but really to control our own destiny. And I wouldn't have thought at this point with only seven points on the table that we'd be in that position. Yes, I thought we'd be chasing everybody else. But what an absolute deal of the cards to be able to really put a chip on our shoulder at this point and say, no, we're better than that. And the door is still wide open for them. I mean, really, it's in mm-hmm. our hands yep. to be able to control that destiny. We just got to go out and put it on the field for 80 minutes. Okay, those are the standings. Uh, follow the Utah Warriors on social media if you aren't already. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, baby. Uh, the match preview, Utah at Seattle. So the back-to-back MLR champs 
Uh, Utah at Seattle, and uh, the, the home field advantage is tremendous for Seawolves. Should be fun. They, have a, they had a lightning delay, but like everyone just stayed around last week. Seven Mountain Time at uh, Starfire Sports Complex on KMYU, Root Sports, and ESPN Plus, where he's looking for the first ever win against the Seawolves. Uh, they have a loss, loss, and then there was the tie uh, last year in Seattle. Notables, second versus uh, third team in the league. Ben Seema's made five conversions this year. Brock Stoller has seven penalty goals, 27 points. Rickard Hatting, three tries, tied for second in MLR. Three uh, try assist, tied for second in MLR. And uh, Utah's going to have to figure it out without Hagen Schulte and uh, go out on the road and play in a tough place to play. But the challenge is there. Can they come out with uh, a four-pointer? Can they come out with at least a bonus point and get those four tries? I, I really think this is a chance for the Utah Warriors to, to really put on their big boy pants and say, you know what, we are this good. This is a chance to go out and, like I said, put that chip on your shoulder and be like, you know what? We are an 80-minute team. We can finish in the final third. Our pack can hang with your pack. Okay? Our forwards can do everything your forwards can do. I've played with some of the forwards on that Seattle side. I've played with a lot of our forwards as well. Physically, we stack up. It's, it's the mental ability to be able to stay in it for a full 80 minutes that Seattle has now shown that they can do, mm -hmm. and we need to be more consistent about. And this is a chance in a tough situation, in maybe the toughest of situations, because we are still talking about the back-to-back -back MLR champions. Even though they're in the position they are in competitively, this is a chance to go out and make a difference. Yeah, you see one and three, but you see two titles right there. It's certainly a challenge. Uh, they, Seattle got over the uh, kind of scoring hump, right? Uh, they had 24, 22, 17, loss, loss, loss. They bust out for 44. So defensively, that will be important. And uh, again, uh, you know, the kicker, a kicker can win you a game. If it's Robbie Pove, uh, there's a lot of pressure right on that leg to score points uh, when those forwards do work and you draw a penalty and, and you go from there. Okay, get the official gear of the Utah Warriors. Kit, shirts, hats, scarves. Uh, Banksy has it all. He doesn't need to get, jump on, but you do. Shop.warriorsrugby.com. Shop.warriorsrugby.com. It's got all the good stuff. For winter, spring, it's getting warmer in Utah. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Okay, our player spotlight, Tuvere Vungakoto. This guy's the hooker. He's been really consistent. He's been playing a ton and at a high level. Uh, he started all four games, 5'11", 246 from Fiji. U20 captain, he made his debut for the national team. Uh, played in the World Cup. I mean, this was a really nice get. And a guy that's been very solid at, at number two. This is a guy that really could be, uh, we use the word star, a lot, but this is the guy that has that kind of power. He is a very likable dude, very soft-spoken, like a lot of Fijians are culturally, but just a guy that goes out and just does his job and works hard. He was the missing piece in the Utah Warriors scrum. We saw last year the struggles that we had at the set piece. He comes in now in between Franco and Gus and really just says, boys, we got this, and has really been that rock and that anchor that that whole forward pack has built themselves around. It's kind of awesome, too. You have the American, the Fijian, and the South African. They just combine for this really nice front row. So player spotlight, Tuvere Vungakotu, the number two, the hooker. Okay, family four-pack. Uh, packages are on sale. WarriorsRugby.com slash tickets. WarriorsRugby.com slash tickets. Join us in a couple of weeks for the home opener. It's NOLA Gold. It's Friday, March 13th. It's got, we promise uh, warm weather. Uh, <laughs> Now that you've said that, thank yeah, you yeah, it's gonna snow. for putting the commentator's curse on it. It's going to snow. No, Jeez. No, it, it's going to be a great experience. We had some great matches last year. I expect the Warriors crowd to really show up for some of these big ones. NOLA was a tremendous match uh, last year. Came down to the wire. Um, looking forward to another good one with the home opener. Okay, Rugby 101. You talked about the mall a little bit earlier. Let's talk about this. So typically a mall happens off of a line-out route, right? That's where players are allowed to compete for the ball on the ground. They bind into a, a guy and then kind of this group and pack forms. So what are the nuances of a mall that people need to know? So a mall happens in one of two ways. It happens when a ball carrier goes into the tackle. So he's running with the ball, goes in, makes contact, but both players keep their feet and the momentum keeps going forward. And then the other players join in behind him. And lots of times you'll hear the referee say, that's a ruck. And then you know the tackle has been made and you have to roll away. Or the referee will say, that's a mall. That's when he recognizes that both the ball carrier and the tackler are still on their feet now it becomes basically a shoving match for forward momentum. The, the ball carrying team has two real opportunities to continue that forward momentum and, and maintain control. The biggest difference in a mall uh, is the ball doesn't have to be at the front of the group of people that, that are involved. 
usually it's your forward pack that are involved. The ball in a mall can actually be moved to the back as long as the players are continuously engaged. Where normally in rugby, you can't have that tractor trailer, you know, there's no, there's no lead blocker. There's no fullback right, right. that's in there. I hate using football references to drive, you know, rugby IQ, but that's really what it is. There's no lead blocker out in front in rugby, except for in a mall when you can form up and usually it's a, a, a front row player holding on to some of his other back row players and they're just driving forward. And yeah. you can either continue to move that, and I've seen malls go for 60, 70 meters before. Oh, yeah, there's but some crazy ones. Yeah. I've, you know, you've also seen them move in different times, 5 meters, 10 meters, and then you can move the ball out and actually use it through the hands. Where we see it the most in, in modern rugby is off the line out. You'll see it inside of, you know, 5 to 10 meters of the goal, inside really the 22. Um, they'll use it to set up and open up the field because it commits so many forwards to the mall. So the ball will come up and be thrown in on the line out. You'll see it taken up and everybody will form there. All eight forwards will commit. It forces the other team to commit eight different forwards into that mall and stop that momentum. And that allows the rest of the field to be opened up for your backline players to take advantage of the space. It gets way wide open, way fast. And that's exciting. I remember in the 2009 national championship match, BYU and Cal, Cal took one from midfield all the way in. It was like devastating, right? It's just like, oh, what do you do? And, and explain to the nuances of you can't let you can't just go to ground and trip them or what. There's a certain way you take down a mall. You can't take down a mall. It's actually a penalty and you have to enter the mall through the front. You can't come into the side and tackle the player or try and spin it. It's all about that head on momentum. So if you come in and engage and stop the forward momentum of the opposing team, then you've done your job. If you make your way through the front and are able to engage the ball handler at that point and whoever has possession, then you can pull that player out and move it to a tackle situation. But really, there's, there's no collapsing a ball. It's a, it's a penalty mm -hmm. and, a, and a free kick to the possessing team. Yeah. Okay, meet the team. Uh, next up, the Loveland Living Planet uh, Aquarium Wednesday, uh, Seven Mountain. It's uh, $12 a person to get in or free for a season ticket holder. So uh, meet the team. We've been at the last couple. These have been awesome. Uh, you get a chat with whoever you want. The Penguins coach. and rugby players, man. Shark Tank. Have you been inside the Shark Tank? Have you been I in haven't there? quite yet, but I know How that. How dare you? I know. It's one of the coolest things on the Wasatch Front. But it's U2. I know the claw from U2's uh, tour is they, out there. Yeah, I'm like, what is that doing here? Yeah. That's awesome. They do have that set up. They yeah. were here at Rice Cycles. They actually found it in storage. And they're using what it. What stores yeah. that? They, this? They found Was the it in claw in storage, and it had been taken down, and <laughs> uh, and it's now made its permanent home because otherwise they were just going to trash it at the Loveland Living Planet Aquarium, and they're going to use it as the centerpiece for an outdoor education arena That's where awesome. they'll be able to do seminars and videos and interactive and displays. And meet the team with and the Utah Warriors. Yeah. Inside, they have one of the coolest aquarium setups. There's a tunnel where you are 180 degrees around you, surrounded by wildlife. Mm. It's super cool. Sharks and stingrays swimming over the top of you and, you know, some of the largest human beings you'll ever encounter with Utah Warriors rugby being in the house. <laughs> the, the scary <laughs> animals and the kind rugby There's, players. <laughs> the scary animals and some sharks. <laughs> <laughs> so come and see the boys. All yeah, right. Come meet the team. It's going to be awesome. Okay, today we have a treat. We're going to talk to two centers, uh, Calvin Whiting and Dominic uh, Tolu Ono. And these guys uh, are talented. Uh, Dominic's story is tremendous. Calvin has come a long ways from a far uh, place to be with the USA and be with the Utah Warriors. So we'll start with uh, Calvin White. With me now, uh, Calvin Whiting. How are you, brother? Thank you for being here. Good, man. Thanks for having me. So uh, tell us about your story, kind of, you know, the, the local kid, really. I mean, you came up through the high school ranks with, yeah. with Colin uh, at United and then all the way through with your time at, at college. Tell us about your story and how you uh, kind of came to rugby and came to America too. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I guess you could say I'm one of those uh, Utah products, right? Um, well, obviously born and raised in Johannesburg, South Africa. Mom and I moved over to the States in 2011. That's when I kind of met up with uh, Coach Colin and United and those boys. Uh, won the national title with them once my junior year, so that was always fun. Good group of guys. I think that was the with. year after I ran with you guys. Probably. Because Daniel totally. wasn't playing then. So you ran with my cousin. Yeah, he, yeah. my sophomore year. Yeah. yeah. So that was yeah. the year I ran with you guys. And, exactly, yeah. And talked yeah. all kinds of crap to the young ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, very true, very true. But yeah, so ended up getting a national title with them the one year. And then um, from there, obviously went to BYU with uh, Smithy and Wayno and uh, had a great experience there. A lot of opportunities came from that. Um, 
was able to play at the Collegiate All-Americans um, and then obviously get my first cap with the Eagles. So uh, a lot of good came from BYU, especially for me at least, and as far as, you know, rugby-wise. So, you know, it's, it's good to be part of that Utah environment and then now to play for the Warriors is just kind of the cherry on top, you know. Well, so married and settling down and, you know, <laughs> yeah. making Utah home. Yeah. We waited for you last year I know, I know. and had a whole lot of waiting. And then now yeah. here we are, though. Yeah. Finally, we get to get to see you for in, the, in the four stripes. And it was really good to, to see you in that run out. Talk about that that early international experience, though. I mean, obviously, the high school success was great. The college success was great. Yeah. But really, the difference maker in in moving from I mean, when I knew you as a as a, as a mm -hmm. sophomore playing a lot of ten, yeah, to to now moving to to center and even playing some wing, yeah, you know, and, and how how different that transition for you. I mean, because it was when you made that international switch that the position change kind of came. I think. Yeah, I think you're right. So it came about uh, Salty Thompson with the high school Americans. He uh, legend. I know, I know. So he kind of put me in that spot of like, okay, you're a bit of a playmaker, but you can also run the ball. So how's about we try it like more of a twelve position? See how you go. And then from 12, it became 13, and then it was all just all over the place. But um, Did Salty move you to 13 because you can yeah, tackle? I think, I don't know. <laughs> You'd have to ask him. But <laughs> You'd have to ask him, but I'm not too sure. Just kind of played around with it and, and ended up loving the center position. So I kind of feel more at home in that area, you know, being able to run the ball, make those tackles. Uh, it's, it's very challenging uh, at times, of course, especially defensively on the outside. Kind of have to make a lot of reads, but um, I, I love the challenge. It's, it's always been a fun one for me. Um, going back to your question though, with the international thing, uh, that was a huge eye-opener for me. Uh, went, I was a little bit younger, so most of the guys were playing you know, pro rugby already, kind of had that experience. And so for me it was more like, okay, so this is what, what it's like when you live, eat, sleep, breathe rugby, right? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of got the feel for that and made you question, okay, is this really what I want to do? Like, would I fit in with this type of environment? Like, how does it all work? And so great eye-opener for me to kind of see future-wise what I would have to put in. Uh, in order to be successful like those boys. How high that ceiling yeah. was. Yeah. And I know you got a taste of that with Salty because he runs yeah. a, a really, yeah, really tip-top program and For has sure. lots of legends have come through his program as well. Lots of 100%. guys that are playing ball yeah. now. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it's it's another notch in Salty's belt yep. uh, to have you there. So full credit to him and, and to that program. Those yeah. guys are fantastic. Um, talk about the impact that, that Coach Latham's had. Obviously now being able for you to come in and, yeah. and see a lot more minutes this year yeah. and, and being able to play. What's the difference in, in having a, a playmaker and a coach with the experience that he's got to be able to teach? Yeah, no, great question. So obviously Latho's a legend, right? I mean, I grew up watching the guy, you know, the, the short socks dude. He yeah. always like, pull the socks down, it's time to go, you know? So always remember watching him growing up and now to have him as a coach has been freaking remarkable, man. Nothing but great communication, uh, pushes you to your boundaries, to know your limits, but also to be able to play under that pressure. Um, the, the, the one thing that sticks out to me with uh, Chris is that he'll back you no matter what. If you give it your 100%, he'll back you. And that's something that I've come to learn a lot about now this season, uh, especially with the past couple of games, kind of getting into, you know, the MLR and stuff like that. So uh, he trusts you 100%. And like, once you have his trust, keep his trust and you'll always be on his good side. So I was here actually the, the first team meeting that he had, I got to sit in the back of that. Okay. And that was one of the big things he said yeah. in that meeting yep. was, you know, you have my trust up front. Exactly. Don't blow it. Exactly. You know, yeah. and he's been true to his word on that. Oh, yeah, 100%. Solid. 100%. That's always great. Yeah. Talk about his chemistry in the locker room, because I've seen the way he walks around, the way yeah. he interacts with you guys. Yeah. It's different having a guy like that who's laced him up at yep. the level that he has now just walking around the locker room. I know. It's, it's, I actually had a thought about that, to be honest, because a lot of the times you'll have a coach that sits on the side and just kind of tells you what to do. Uh, Latho is completely opposite. He wants to get stuck in. I mean, the first couple of practices we had that we were going live, he would still come and check you in the ruck, you know, like come and give you a good smack, make sure you're sealing the ball oh, right. Yeah. And it's like, I've seen him like, yeah. holding a shield. Yeah. In, you know, Throws his body. Yeah. He's on the bags. Exactly. He's counter rucking yeah. in drills. And it's awesome for us, man, to have a coach that wants to be involved like that. And, and to be honest, all of the coaches are like that. And, and I think it's just that kind of that, that chemistry that we have now with him is just kind of helping us players grow uh, as much as we can, you know, to our full potential. So it's, it's been so, so fun, man. So. So cool. Talk about the options you guys have in the back line. Obviously Ooh. things are still very much in flux. They're still trying to yeah. sort out yeah. what the best options are where, but the weapons that you guys oh have yeah. at your disposal at all the different positions from you and Gen and more to not allow T coming yeah. healthy, now yeah. Josh coming healthy. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of yeah. different options for you guys. No kidding. In the back line. Uh, yeah, some serious weapons, like you said. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really fun to play with these guys because at every practice it like pushes you to be your best because you know you have to compete next to the guy to you. Like although it's your teammate, like you still want to make sure that 
what can I do to make sure that I can get a, a spot in the lineup? You right. Know? So it's it's good to have those guys uh, to have you to have there to kind of push you along and make sure you're getting challenged in your position. So uh, I mean, props to them, and I mean the experience that we have. You know, Fitz, uh, Blakey coming from Northlands. You know, Hagen, his experience, Robbie. I mean, all the boys have their own dynamic of of what they have and what they bring to the table. So it's just being able to kind of soak it all in and and make it your own, and then kind of run with it because it's man, it's it's awesome. When we're on, we're on. Can we talk about Hagen? Is that a, is that a thing we can mention here? Is that public knowledge? Obviously, you know, talk about the yeah. injury and the difference Ooh, that yeah. makes Tough, losing a guy that's a point scorer like that, but not just a point scorer, mm -hmm. a leader on the field and in the locker room, man. How oh, does yeah. it affect you guys? Um, it's luckily we have boys that can step up. Uh, Robbie's done a great job so far, but I mean, obviously, to lose Hagen is big because I mean, he's he's that leader that you want on the field to kind of direct traffic, make sure you know you know where you're going, what's happening next. Um, and it's, it's more of like a calmness that you feel when he's on the field because you know how things are going to go. He really did have that demeanor. Yeah. Everything yeah. from, you know, just Smooth. his presence yeah. on the field, the way he took his kicks, like exactly. everything was just so relaxed yeah. with him. Yeah, it looks like he's, he's so cool-headed, man. It's, it's incredible to watch. And so losing that, will it'll be obviously a challenge for us, kind of see how we can adapt to it. But we're always up for it, so we'll okay. see what we can do. I'm going to bring something out out of your past here a little bit. Okay. Are we going to see the return of any... Calvin dancing videos oh. <laughs> in, in your in your high school days again I know this because I knew him as a kid oh, there were a lot geez. of videos that are probably still on YouTube somewhere probably, if you do your searching yeah, yeah, yeah. of, of yeah. some some pretty sassy choreography <laughs> Are you gonna see the return yeah. of that? You gonna you still got your dancing shoes? Right? I mean, always, always, always <laughs> ready. Yeah, so it's just being able to get back into it. I mean, that's what we did in high school. I mean, me and a couple. Shouts of out guys. to Tanu and Daniel. Yeah, Tanu, Daniel. Yeah, they all know. They, I was kind of like the token white boy, you know. That would always just kind of be brought along with the polys because I had somewhat rhythm. And so they're like, "Hey, you can kind of dance. Like, do you want to come? Like, just just muck around." I was like, "Yeah, sure." And then. I kind of had my style of, you know, dancing in South Africa and kind of brought it with us. And they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, so me and Tony actually ended up doing something for uh, my, I guess your school, not pageant show, but like a, they call it. It's the like a talent show. Yeah, yeah, talent show. And so that was funny because everyone was like so, like so unexpected, but it was really fun. It was yeah. cool to see you guys break out. All yeah, right, man. Yeah. Always a good sport, Calvin. Thank Appreciate you so it, much. All good the best you, man. the rest of the season, brother. Appreciate it, bro. Thanks. All right, our next guest on debut this last week versus Colorado, Dom Toluono. How are you, brother? I'm doing good, man. Doing good. Thanks for being here with us. So tell us about your story. We're going with the local boys today. Obviously, we just had Calvin on. Tell us about your story about coming up through, uh, through the school ranks here in the state. Um, so I ended up playing rugby because I saw a random flyer in my high school for Wasatch uh, Rugby Club, which is Terzo and Murray. So that's where I started, and my dad was a big rugby player. So... You know, he taught me all I know. So I played in high school with uh, Wasatch. And then from there, I went to Slick but, uh, for a year. And uh, I played at uh, UVU, Utah, BYU. Uh, we were all right, we weren't great, but it was a good experience. And then from there, I just played men's league with Mana, the Gladiators, and uh, Haggis, so. so and I know you from the last couple of years playing with Haggis and really watched you develop from a kid that liked playing rugby into a proper rugby player you know talk about the experience and playing up through the different levels and kind of that development the difference that it makes uh yeah it definitely keeps going up like especially this uh there's a big difference from men's league to the mlr like it's a lot faster but you know it's great you know learning at the speed and all that because the competition is higher too which is uh, like i like a challenge and you know it's just great playing with all these boys so who's been the biggest impact on you in the locker room since you've come in? You've, I mean, you've got a really quiet personality, but there's a good group of guys here that have kind of really taken a bunch of the young guys under their wing. And obviously, you earned it, yeah. getting, the, getting the call and getting the start at center this last week. So yeah. you're doing something right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say Fetz has uh, taken me under his wing a lot. He's always there. Uh, Fetz, Gannon, Blake, mostly all the boys, they just, you know, they're there to help you out. You know, there's no one there that's, like, trying to, you know, put you down. Everyone's just very like cohesive. Like we're all just there for each other. Which is I've noticed that's a big difference in this locker room, as compared to a lot of different teams. Is there's no real jealousy. Everybody's there to help everybody get better. Have you seen the same thing? Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, if I even if I don't get the start, you know, like I was hoping to go out there to Atlanta, but I didn't get it. And but I was happy for the boys that are out there. You know, I was at home cheering them on with everything I had. You know, it's just even if you don't get uh, picked, you just back your brother out here. Have hope they go get that dub for you all right now the real important things 
With the hair, brother. Setting <laughs> standards with the hair. What's going on here? Uh, it's my, been my haircut since I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, a lot of people call it the Kiwi cut or the South of France. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I mean, the Kiwi cut had a little more like faux mohawk on the top of it, didn't it? And you got to yeah. get some lines in there for it to be that old Kiwi cut. You get the steps yeah. cut into that or anything? Uh, no, I don't really like the faux hawk look. I like it short on top. <laughs> It's easier to work with in the morning too. You're gonna go full long mullet in the back or are you just keeping it with the, uh, the short and tight there? Nah, I don't like it long. <laughs> kind of want a tail, but yeah, my mom would kill me. So can't do that. I'm a man now, mom. Can't tell me <laughs> what to do. <laughs> yeah. Look, super happy to, to see all of your success, to have you here as part of the Warriors family and to be on the squad. You're a kid that, that everybody's rooting for and we hope to see more and more success as you continue on. Thank right. you for being here with us, brother. Thanks, man, appreciate it. All right, that'll do it for us. Uh, great conversation with those guys. They uh, are some playmakers. Dominic got to start last week. Calvin's going to be a star in this league. Um, I'm glad they're on the Warriors. Man. It was great to see Dom on debut. Both of them locals and have, have kind of come up through the, the Utah youth rugby ranks. Great to see them in the Warriors colors and nothing but good things in both of those guys' futures. Those are both some hardworking dudes and some really good human beings and some great rugby players. Okay, share the Warriors cast on YouTube, Facebook, SoundCloud, IGTV, Apple Podcasts. You can leave us a rating and review for Dom and Calvin Whiting, Billy the producer, Banksy, I'm Jerem Jordan. That'll do it for us. You've been watching and listening to the Warriors cast.